so far we've covered torque, which is the analog of force in angular motion. And then we did angular momentum. And now we're gonna take care of rotational kinetic energy. So just like we had kinetic energy when something was moving at some velocity, we'll have rotational kinetic energy when something is spinning. <clears throat> so if in linear motion, the kinetic energy was one half mv squared, then you could imagine that the kinetic energy for rotational motion is one half m omega squared because this omega is just angular velocity. Oh. <clears throat> and we have to use moment of inertia because that's the analog for mass for rotating things. So if we look at the units for the top one, We've got kilogram meters squared per second squared. And then in the bottom, the units for moment of inertia is kilogram meters squared. And then the unit for angular velocity is either radians per second or one over second. So you get one over second squared. And so these two things have the same units, which is good. So any questions about this? So that's the equation that we'll be working with. And now let's look at some examples. So if you just had, say you had a CD that was spinning at some angular velocity of eight pi radians per second. And the moment of inertia for a disc is one half m r squared. So if we were given some radius, let's say the radius of a CD is 4.5 centimeters and the mass of a CD is 33 grams. <clears throat> then we could calculate the rotational kinetic energy of this CD. So the formula is I omega squared, B moment of inertia is one half mR squared. So we would get one half 0, 0.0 three kilograms 
times 0 0.045 meters times 8 pi squared. Zero point zero two one. And then we said that the units for this were kilogram meter squared per second squared. But we also know that the units for energy are joules. So you can write kilogram meters squared per second squared, or you can just write joules. And so that's how we deal with something that's spinning, but it's staying in place. So uh, CDs, hard drives, um, you when you were standing on the platforms in the lab spinning in place. So any questions about this? So now that we've done spinning in place, now what happens is something is spinning and it's moving at some velocity. So looking at this, we could maybe do the earth. So if we think about the earth going around the sun, then the earth is spinning on its own axis while it's also orbiting the sun. So the earth is gonna have some tangential velocity and then it's gonna have some rotational velocity on its axis. So, the total kinetic energy that the Earth would have would be its rotational plus its linear. One half I omega squared <clears throat> plus one half M V squared. So the angular velocity of the earth is it does two pi radians so one full rotation every day and so if you wanted to convert that to um, seconds, you would need to know how many seconds are in a day. So there's 3,600 seconds in one hour. 
and there's 24 hours in one day. So one day is 24 hours, and then one hour is 3,600 seconds. So if you plug that into your calculator, you would get something small. Zero point zero zero four zeros and seven three radians per second. <clears throat> So then we would also need the moment of inertia of the earth. And so for a solid sphere, the moment of inertia is two fifths m r squared. So m would just be the mass of the earth. R would be the radius of the earth. So the mass of the earth is 5.97 times 10 to the 24 kilogram or is it? yeah. And then the radius of the earth Six point three seven eight times ten to the six meters. And then square that. Moment of inertia for the Earth is one point one point five two times ten to the thirty seven, and then the units for that are kilogram meters squared. Okay, so now the only thing that we don't know in this equation now. So we found this, we found this, we know the mass of the earth. So now we just need the tangential velocity of the earth. <clears throat> so we'll calculate that on the next slide. So any questions about this so far? Okay. So the only thing we need now is the tangential velocity of the earth. So we'll remember that the only force acting on the earth is the gravitational force from the sun. And the gravitational force looks like G m sun and earth over r squared. And because the earth is doing circular motion, that equals ma, but the a is a special acceleration called the centripetal acceleration. And we'll remember that the, oh, 
and this m should be the mass of the earth we'll remember that the centripetal acceleration equals vt squared over r so you'll see some things canceling so the m earth goes away and then one of the r's go away and so if you're solving for the tangential velocity, you'll get square root g m sun over r. So square root of 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. The mass of the sun is bigger than the mass of the earth. One point nine nine times ten to the thirtieth kilograms, and then the radius of the Earth's orbit is one point four. Nine six times ten to the eleven meters, and so when you plug all that into your calculator, You get two nine seven eight six seven meters per second. So now we have all of the things that we need to calculate the total kinetic energy of the earth going around the sun. So we've got this, I guess we'll do a new slide. <clears throat> so the total kinetic energy was rotational plus, so this might be written as linear or translational. So translational means the same thing as linear. So the rotational was one half I omega squared. The kinetic is one half MB squared. And if we go back to this, page, so we calculated the moment of inertia of the Earth as 1.52 times 10 to the 37. 1.52 times 10 to the 37. Omega was four zeros and then seven three. And then we're going to square that. The mass of the Earth is 5.97 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. And then the velocity we found was 29787. 29787. And then we square that. So if we look at all of these things and we plug them into our calculator, we would get
very big number. Mm -hmm. Two point six five times ten to the thirty three joules. Okay, so this was an example of something where the spin of the object is not necessarily related to how it's moving. So now we're going to look up. Uh, so a situation where the spin of the object directly relates to how the object moves in its linear motion. And so that is called rolling. And specifically in this class, we'll look at rolling without slipping. I'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, but Rolling is exactly what it sounds like. So if you have a wheel or a tire of your car or bicycle, <clears throat> then you know that the tire is rotating with some rotational velocity. And you know that it's also moving with some translational velocity, right? So your car's tires spin so that you can move forward. Now, unlike the previous example where the rotation and the velocity weren't related here, they're gonna be directly related. So I'll come back to that in a second. So first we wanna look at what this, how, how is this situation possible? So if you had something that was just spinning, and you can think back to the earth or something like that, just because something is spinning doesn't mean it's gonna move in any direction. So there has to be something else going on. So if we look at the point of contact between the wheel and the ground, then what's happening here is that there's actually a friction force that's acting on the wheel when it touches the famous question to ask. So if you have, oh, I, drop this. I guess I'll just draw one. So if you had a ball on a ramp, And let's say I could draw in three dimensions and you had two balls, one solid and one hollow. Uh, the question would be which one would reach the bottom of the ramp first. So the moment of inertia for a hollow sphere <clears throat> is two thirds m r squared. And the moment of inertia for a solid sphere is two fifths m r squared. So, just given those two things, uh, what would you guess as the answer? Which one is going to get to the bottom of the ramp first, the hollow sphere or the solid sphere? So some people think solid, that some people think hollow. Okay, so let's figure it out. So we're starting from some height and at the bottom, we're gonna have some velocity. So 
So here's our initial picture. And then our final picture, we would have some velocity, but we would also be rotating because this thing is going to roll down the ramp. So we're going to have some this way, some rotational velocity. So what, what do we do if we have something that starts at some height and ends up with some velocity? What kind of problem solving method would you use? Yeah. Mm, we could try that, but it would be harder. So something is going to be conserved, not momentum, but energy. So anytime you see something that's starting at some height, you're either going to do kinematics or conservation of energy. <clears throat> So we can write all of the things that could be, so we could have some initial potential, some initial kinetic, and then we can have some final potential and some final kinetic. So if we define this at the bottom of the ramp to be a height of zero, then we'll have no final potential energy. Or here, let me, I'll just write out all of these things. So we start at some height h, so we'll have some initial potential energy. We start at rest, so we have no kinetic energy from translation or from rotation. And then we end up at a height of zero, so we have no final potential energy. So in a sense, we're turning some initial potential energy into all kinetic energy. And the way we have it written now is it's all split up between rotational and linear velocity. Now, If we remember the velocity and the angular velocity are related to each other by this equation. So if you take your angular velocity, no, not divided by, this should be multiply it by. Take your angular velocity and multiply it by r, you would get your linear velocity. Or if we wanted to solve for angular velocity, we would take our linear velocity and divide that by r. So now I'm going to take this, and plug it into our equation for omega final squared. So we have mgh initial equals one half m e final squared plus one half i 
B squared over R squared. And so now if you look at our equation, we only have one unknown and that's the final velocity. So we could solve this, but it turns out that there's even more simplification that we can do. Uh, so we'll do that now. So if you look at the two moment of inertias that we started with, those can be plugged in here. So we'll do that on the next slide. So we have this equation, mgh initial equals one half mv final squared plus one half i b final squared over r squared. And now we have two different moment of inertias that we were looking at. We have solid sphere, which was two fifths MR squared. And we have hollow sphere, two thirds MR squared. And these are what we're plugging into here. So we'll start with the solid sphere. So one half times two fifths m r squared, b final squared over r squared. And so now you see that there's an r squared on the bottom here, and there's an r squared on the top here. So those are gonna cancel. And then you can also cancel this too if you want. And what we're left with is one half m v final squared plus one fifth m v final squared. So they're both m v final squared. One has a one half and one has a one fifth. So we would just add one half plus one fifth. Yes. How does the m g h? I just didn't write it down. Okay, so we're adding one half plus one fifth. So you would have to change that into tenths. So this would be five tenths and the final squared plus two tenths and the final squared. So that's seven over 10 and the final squared. So you should see that there's mass on both sides. So those masses will go away. So it doesn't matter how big the ball is. Uh, then if we were solving for the final velocity, we would move the seven tenths to the other side and then take the square root. And that would be our final expression for the final velocity of the solid sphere. So now we'll do the same process for the hollow sphere. So the R squareds both cancel. 
You can cancel that too again also. And now we've got MGH initial equals one half and B final squared plus one third and B final squared. So we would need to turn those into sixths. So this is three sixths. This is two over six. Again, all the masses can cancel out. <clears throat> Adding three six plus two six would be five six. And then solving for the final, we get six over five. G H initial. So what's bigger, 10 divided by seven or six divided by five? So it's gonna be the 10 divided by seven, it's bigger. <clears throat> and now the logic you would use is that because the final velocity of the solid sphere is bigger, and they both had the same distance that they were uh, going from rest to that final velocity, then the acceleration on the solid sphere was bigger. And so it would make it down the ramp first. <clears throat> and you can test this if you want with any, anything that's round and rolls. If you take a hollow, hollow version and a solid version, the solid version should get down the ramp first at a time. And so again, the reason that we were able to make this important substitution back here was because the when something is rolling, the linear velocity and the angular velocity are related by this equation. And so because we could make that substitution in the end, basically everything could cancel and we're just left with velocity relating to gravity and 